Denise Wenling at the American Diabetes Association Annual Scientific Sessions. I'm speaking with Ms. Kirstine Bell. She presented a much needed meta-analysis on the efficacy of carbohydrate counting in type 1 diabetes. So overall, the, the meta-analysis really revealed that there, there is very limited evidence for the efficacy of carbohydrate counting in type 1. Um, we could only find six quality randomized controlled trials that were looking at HbA1c uh, in uh, type 1 diabetes, and that was in both children and adults. But really, when you consider that this is such an integral element of type 1 diabetes management for millions of people around the world, to only have six studies underpinning the evidence base is really small. Um, and ultimately, there was no significant improvement in HbA1c with carb counting. How are physicians, clinicians supposed to interpret this? They're not about to abandon it. What can they do? No, we definitely don't want to abandon carbohydrate counting. This is still the best known method for adjusting insulin doses based on mealtime um, choices. But what we do want to encourage is that there are some limitations to the system. Um, you know, for example, it assumes that all carbohydrates affect blood glucose levels equally. Um, and we know that that's not quite the case from the GI or the glycemic index. Um, that there, we do get significantly varying results. Um, but also that there are some other factors at play in terms of determining insulin uh, requirements as well. Um, there's been a lot of interesting research at this uh, meeting regarding the effects of protein and fat um, on type 1 diabetes insulin requirements. Um, so that's something that we've been looking at as well. Um, so the, we've come up with a food insulin index that basically measures how much insulin uh, healthy people would produce in response to particular foods and trying to use that as a basis for how much insulin people with type 1 diabetes use. Um, but there's also been methods from around the world showing that um, we need to maybe use carbohydrate counting with the addition of fat and protein. So there's been a few different approaches, um, but the same, the same result essentially, carbohydrate counting on its own might not be enough and that's also what we found in this meta-analysis. Um, your new tool, the FID, um, what advantage might it have over carbohydrate counting? The main advantage is that it's measuring the overall insulin response in healthy people. So at the moment, like I said, there are a few other factors such as protein and fat, but also gastrointestinal hormones and the cephalic phase. So looking at just by smelling and seeing food, we start producing insulin. Um, and carbohydrate counting on its own doesn't measure any of those factors. Um, but we, so we don't know what contribution those factors might make um, in isolation, but also in combination in different foods. Um, so the advantage of the Food Insulin Index is that it actually measures that overall production. So we don't need to know absolutely every factor in great detail. We're not up to that stage uh, scientifically yet, but it gives us that overall insulin response that we can use to help determine the total insulin dose in people with type 1 diabetes. And where are you at in terms of study? Have you tried using it yet, or is it being tested in people in everyday use? Um, at the moment, we've done a number of clinical result, uh, studies, and we've got some good results there, um, quite promising. And we've actually just started implementing it in practice, uh, still in a research setting. We're not ready to actually start rolling it out um, clinically around the world or anything like that yet. It's still very much in its infancy. But, um, but yeah, but it's very exciting to start to see people being able to use this system in practice and the blood glucose results we can get as a result. Thank you. Appreciate your time, Isabel. Thanks very much.